Steve Valentine, Valentine Financial Options. I'm a mortgage broker in and around the local area, but it wouldn't stop me. I'm a premier mortgage broker in and around the area. It wouldn't stop me traveling to anywhere. So if, um, I mean, for example, I used to have business in Norwich until I moved back to Coventry. I've got business in Nottingham, Derby, uh, Milton Keynes, as far as um, Watford, where people have uh, spoken to me and moved out of the area or referred me to family in and out the area. So I'm not adverse to travel, although I do tend to stick mainly to the local area. What I also like to do is face-to-face -face business. I do all of my fact finds and all of my uh, information gathering face-to-face -face because I feel it just gives everybody a better uh, handle on who they're dealing with and as the process progresses you can then um, people know who you are and I think it's easier to do business that way. Still, what is a mortgage? A mortgage is a secured loan against a property and you can all stop and ask me if you have any questions because I've only got three subjects. <laughs> um, so it's a secured loan against a property. Basically, a lender will look at the property, make a decision as to whether it's worth what you're paying for it, and then give you a loan accordingly with the um, charge on the property. The charge on the property means if you default on that loan for any reason, they are in a position to repossess that property, sell it on to get their money back. <coughs> a mortgage is um, although it's the loan how they calculate whether they want to lend to you or not there is um, they will take into account elements of risk for example um, the loan to value if you were looking to borrow 95 percent of the value of the property you are a higher risk to that mortgage lender so the factors that they include within um, their assessment, they have to take into account uh, market movement, whether that house may devalue. Um, they look at your credit file. They look at your earnings. They look at your stability within a job. So all of these elements come together. Uh, and one of the uh, major elements also is affordability. In the good old days, a lot of lenders would look at your affordability as a multiplier of your earnings, generally around three times. Some, then they, it worked up to, uh, to 3.5. Now there are two factors with affordability. One is the multiplier of your earnings. Some lenders go up to about five times and some will go up to 4.25. But also they look at your spending habits. So now when I put a case forward, you'll find that um, they want bank statements. They, they obviously look at your credit file to make sure you're credit worthy. But they'll look at your spending habits to make sure that you don't overspend. Um, because on a multiplier, you could get a guy earning 30,000 and at three and a half times, they'll give you um, 105. But if your spending habits dictate that you can't afford the mortgage payment, they're not going to lend to you. So they do take into account a lot of elements. Um, at the moment, with the crash from 2008, there's um, people that encountered financial difficulties. There are the lenders now. Uh, uh, there's some specialist lenders out there as well as mainstream. If you've had financial difficulties, um, provided you've been good with your credit for, for probably the last four or five years, you will be able to find high street lenders. There are some that will lend. If you've experienced deeper financial difficulties like county court judgments, uh, even bankruptcy, there are actually specialist lenders out there that will <coughs> lend to people. Obviously, you pay the premium for that if that type of lending is required. Um, I would generally look at a case 
on individual merit and if I felt that it needed more detailed attention than I could give it I would recommend that they perhaps looked to another provider um, and take on specialist advice rather than general broad mortgage advice. Right, the types of mortgage that you can have, it's, it's very um, basic. You can have a fixed rate mortgage, <coughs> which gives you a known payment for a period of time. Anybody can stop me and ask a question at any point. <laughs> Um, so with a fixed rate mortgage, you can fix it for two years, three years, five years. There are actually 10 year fixed out there at the moment. Um, what you tend to find is the setup fees will probably be similar. Um, there are a lot of lenders out there at the moment, certainly for first time buyers and remortgage where there's no fees. Um, but you pay a slightly higher interest rate. You can get a, a lower interest rate by paying the fee. Um, Deal, yeah. And then you pay your fees all over again after two years. So isn't it a money making scheme for the mortgage people? Where do you take well, it? Well, the, the lender. Right. I'm glad you stopped me because that lets me go into this. Um, with the deals, you might find, for example, you pay a thousand pounds and you'll get a 1.54 deal. You pay nothing, and you'll get a 1.99 deal. So. With that, what you're looking at is, is it in your interest to pay the fee? Yeah. Generally, if you're looking at a mortgage up to, say, 150, it isn't. You're actually better off paying slightly more interest than paying the fee up front. And for people that um, are remortgaging, um, they, they look at how much premium they're going to pay. For first-time buyers, um, you tend to, I, I generally like somebody else involved, especially if they're younger first time buyers, um, I invite the parents or invite them to invite the parents because what tends to happen is um, I, call, I call them me dad. Now me dad said, who happens to be a plumber, but me dad knows all about mortgages. So me dad's been on the, um, on the internet and he's seen a deal for 1.2%. So he then wants to know why little Jimmy can't have that deal. That deal happens to be for a 50% loan to value and you're paying 1,500 pounds up front and it doesn't qualify. But people see headline rates. It's the same as walking into, a, into say, a clothes shop and outside it's got 70% off most objects. But when you actually get in there, the 70% is off a pair of um, faded shoes that nobody's going to buy anyway. It's a headline rate to get you through the door. Is, is it true that the longer the fixed rate, the higher the redemption penalty? Generally, yeah. Uh, if, if we're looking, if we can move on with a, with a fixed rate, we've looked at the fees and, and the ratios of interest yeah, rates. Yeah. With, Have you, uh, with yeah, let's, say, nice. let's say you're taking a, a fixed and available rate. Yeah. Does that affect the amount the lender will advance you? Say you decide you want a variable rate mortgage. Is that reflected in the amount they'll actually advance rather than against a fixed, taking a fixed rate? Or have you got no not, not necessarily. Not it, might be a, it might be a variable rate that will um, only go to 70%. Affor percent. Affordability is regardless of, of type of um, rate. Okay. Need a second microphone, Simon, for questions from the audience. Go, going back to your... <laughs> question sorry sorry right generally if you look at a mortgage any any mortgage deal and there's very few now that don't carry a redemption most lenders will look at a two-year fixed and they'll put one percent of outstanding loan for year two and two percent for year one so I've told you that the wrong way around but if you paid it off within the first 12 months two percent if you pay it off within 12 to 24 months it's one percent if you look at, say, a five-year mortgage, you're looking generally at year one, 5%, year two, 4%, 3%, 2%. Yeah, and a 10-year mortgage, 10-year fixed? 10-year fixed, a lot of the deals now, it's a five-year redemption. And you'll pay your 54321 in the first 
five years and then it will be no redemption after that. Um, but again, if you take um, a two year deal, you might pay 199. If you take a five year deal, you might pay 2.4, uh, 2.34, something like that. So those, those types of deals um, are, are basically, most people are looking at two to five years. The, uh, the questions that I do get asked quite often is, um, certainly by self-employed, last time I did a mortgage, I told them I couldn't afford it, and that was it. They were known as self-cert. Now, the, the government, through their various regulatory agencies, have had to show that they're now getting slightly responsible, and the lenders have to show that they're being responsible. So. Ten years ago, when you walked past the bank and held out your hands and caught the money as they threw it out the windows, those days are now long gone. Um, and the self-certificated mortgages, you cannot get anymore. Don't exist. Don't exist. Well, even with a, huge, a, a big deposit, you can't. No. And also, interest only. There are some interest only mortgages back on the market. Um, Generally, you can get interest only on buy to let because it is not your residential. And most like you to use um, interest only because it means that the rental income can uh, offset against what you pay in mortgage. And they'll use factors to make sure that the <coughs> rental income would cover the mortgage. Other interest only, the general um, rule of thumb is when you pay your mortgage off you can't be left in a position that you may be homeless so lenders have different criterias but uh, uh, the example would be um, you could get an interest only mortgage if your property is worth three hundred thousand pounds and you're only taking a fifty percent loan to value which means when you come to pay your mortgage off you sell your property you still have hundred and fifty thousand left which they deem would buy you somewhere you can live in. So technically, they're not making you homeless. Not all lenders like the interest only. There are risk factors involved in that. And um, f from the point of view, do they like to do it? Not really. They would like to see larger, um, larger property values and probably less loan to value. You know, if you've got a 500,000 pound house, and you want to borrow 30% against your property value, they're probably quite comfortable with that because there's enough money to say that they've done their due diligence and um, they're not putting you into financial difficulties. The, um, the types of buyer that I tend to deal with and come across are first-time buyers, home movers, remortgage. Um, remortgage for deal, so it's somebody who doesn't want to borrow any extra money, they just want a better rate because their rates come to an end and the variable rates are quite high. Um, and also there's the remortgage for capital raising. Capital raising can be um, for holiday, home improvement, new car, and what's been quite popular is debt consolidation. Debt consolidation now is being frowned upon by lenders, regulators, and networks of people like myself, purely because if I took your personal loan that's got three years left to run and your credit card, and there was 20,000 pounds outstanding, and put it to a mortgage that has got 18 years left to run, when you do the maths on that, although I've made it very, very cheap on your monthly payment, it's cost you twice, three times the amount in interest by the time you've paid it off. And to keep on top of best advice, what regulators are saying at the moment is you've got to seriously justify this because in three or four years' time, the complaints will be coming flooding back in and people will be suing lenders, brokers for the difference between what they would have paid and what they have paid. 
because it, it's, it's very easy to forget. You're paying £450 now on your outgoing for your debt. Okay, you may have it paid off within three years on your loan. The credit card, it depends how much you want to pay off as to how quick you'll pay it off. Um, and that £450 is converted to 150 So you're saving £300 a month, which is great on your pocket at the moment. But as we all know, and as we're finding out, very clever legal people are... Um, <laughs> Oh, they're such individuals. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are coming up with, are coming up with um, that you didn't know what you were doing. It's the same as there's certain business I won't do because, well, the network have actually said, we won't accept it. We won't let you do it. Um, God, let's do, I know you don't do these. Equity release. Yeah. Uh, I was sitting down with a, <coughs> a client a couple of months ago now. And they happened to mention that mum and dad had taken out an equity release mortgage 15 years ago without informing them. And the, uh, Let me guess, no value in the property. Well, at the moment, no, the, the, the loan had gone from about 14 grand, which is, from your point of view, if you're sitting down and saying, well, what are your options to 14 grand? You don't want 14 grand. And the family could have given them 14 grand at the time. But the focus report said that they discussed it with the family and all this sort of the, the loan was standing at 65. We had a letter in, grand, we had a letter in last week saying that they'd weigh 46 grand of it without an argument. Yeah. So that sort of thing. Well, I, I, they probably know they haven't got a leg to stand on. Well, they did when they um, sent them a letter, yeah. When, when people, it's not something I deal with, but when people talk yeah. to me about equity release, um, I won't offer any advice other than you seriously need to consider so this. An equity release is where you own a house for 200,000. The equity release will come along and they'll say, right, your age group, we will lend you up to 25% of the value of the property. You don't pay us anything back, but the interest will roll over and they'll charge you at say 6.5%. So basically every 10 years, your debt doubles or every seven to ten years your debt doubles what they'll say is or, or the selling point would be but your house will go up by that much in value so pro rata it won't matter I've actually dealt with a lady who um, who borrowed 40,000 and within about nine years it had gone to 86 um, the only time I would ever consider um, saying to somebody, look at equity release, would be if you've got no dependents, no heirs, no one to leave it to, and you're not too bothered whether the cat gets a <coughs> 10 or 15,000. Well, you discuss it with the heirs as well at the same time. Yeah, if, the, if there isn't anyone. Um, because there, are, there may be other ways to raise money if you really need it. Uh, and one of them would be to downsize. But yeah, equity release is quite a dangerous animal. I don't, uh, I don't necessarily so agree with it. But just downsized before they got into it. Yeah. No, but the rules and regulations are getting a lot. They're better. I don't have issues with any kind of regulation because you need to work within within boundaries that ensure that your clients are protected. Um, I sometimes think that um, you can get embroiled where the people that make these decisions and make these regulations have never actually worked in the industry you're in and don't understand. And you see the soapbox working. Yeah, it'd be hearing What is the inconsistencies across lenders about what they want? Because... Uh, SA302, accounting certificates, HMRC tax overviews. Because you know yourself, it's like... Oh, if I were to say to you, um, the Inland Revenue has said we require this implementation. But, but, but if, the, if they say to you, right, for, for whatever, we need this implementation, and you say, well, how do you want us to implement it? They say, we don't know, but we'll let you know if you get it wrong. Yeah, but HMRC has said the tax overview is sufficient, but you still yeah. get a massive 
then there's actually for the SAPO2. I, I totally agree. It, it, it drives me mad. Um, I'm, I don't charge fees. I don't charge broker fees. And now, part of my upfront speak is, if I ask you for something, it's not me being pedantic, it's not me being awkward. Why, when I'm going to get paid by the lender when we complete this case, and I'm going to get paid the same amount of money, why am I going to make a 20-hour case last 30 hours? Why am I going to chase you around making <coughs> phone calls, calling around to pick stuff? Why am I going to do that? It doesn't make sense. Um, the only thing is, it's like with most regulators, the inconsistencies are they tell you what they think they want and tell you when they when you, you they feel you've got it right which is really really awkward because it causes a lot of situations they'll say we want this implementing we're not going to tell you how we're not going to tell you why and we're not going to tell you the outcomes but implement it so everybody puts their own spin on it and it makes it really really you're quite right it makes it really inconsistent in the marketplace a little bit like um, somebody will go to their bank and their bank's criteria, lending criteria, says we can't do this. They'll come to me, I go to the open market, the, the, I know that that bank won't do it, but I know that there's 14 other lenders that will. And it, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's interpretation. And there have not been any major fines across mortgage lending for a number of years and a lot of the lenders at the moment are concerned that they need to show what they're doing to, to the point of overkill because they really don't know who's going to get it next and where it's going to come from. So due diligence and everything that goes with it is, is really quite high on the agenda to the point of making it very, very difficult for people to lend. You, you, You'd say it was common sense. Can they afford it? Yes, they can. Are they a risk? Well, actually, their credit records say no. Um, are they in good work? You know, are the working condition? Well, they've both been employed in the same companies for over three years. Um, everything says, yes, let's lend to them. But they want a £1,000 more than the um, perceived criteria allows them to have. So it's either a down value on the loan or, in some cases, a straight decline. And you think there's no common sense being applied here because you could get somebody else that's earning really, really good money and it's not, it's not a problem, but they've got the worst credit record ever. Uh, something else that I've come across recently, and I may have mentioned this before, um, if you know of anybody certainly coming into the market for um, mortgage, remortgage, or first-time buyers, payday loans. Payday loans are the worst thing, in my opinion, ever. Because what's happening, and I'm going to tell you a true story now, guy earning £70,000, his wife earns 30000 well, 29000 £30,000. They're on hundred grand between them. He works away a lot. Now, to boost their savings, when he gets paid, he puts as much as he possibly can into the savings. But he works away a lot. He likes his pop. So a week to go before he gets paid, he thinks he needs a couple of hundred quid. He's going to have a tough up thing. So he goes to Wonga, and he gets his couple of hundred quid. Four or five days later, he pays them off. He did that in February. He did it again in March. They wanted a loan of 250,000, which is two and a half times joint. They don't have any other credit other than this idiot's gone to Wonga twice for a couple of hundred quid. Straight decline because he can't manage his money. Because you have to meet their criteria. It's a little bit like I can prove, I, I, I've got people, they're paying £750 a month, but the criteria from the lender dictates they can't afford a £600 you, mortgage. When you own your own business, you keep your income as low as possible to keep the tax, or the tax. How do you balance the fact? Because the argument, yeah, the argument there is, how can you possibly spend it if you haven't earned it? 
and you've only earned it if you've declared it to the tax office. So, that, yeah, I, I mean, a, a, an accountant... I get, I get people coming to me and say, I don't want to pay much tax. And two years later, they come and say, I need a mortgage. Yeah. A lot, yeah. a lot more tax. <laughs> you know, you've got a choice. Once you've got the mortgage, somewhere in the small print it will probably be that they can redeem it at any point. It's a little bit like a bank in an overdraft. Um, but generally, if you've got the mortgage with that company and you come to the end of your deal, Yes, you'll go straight onto the variable, but in general, they will offer you another rate. The reason I'm asking is, I can't, according to the bank, I can't afford my mortgage. So it's coming to end soon, so I need to... They should offer you another rate. Yeah, I, it's interesting. Though, and if, you, if you're not 100% sure, I can give you uh, a, a few examples of where, um, when you deal with your bank, you're limited to their criteria. Um, as a comprehensive broker, it used to be whole of market, but now we're comprehensive, um, <laughs> there are different lending criteria for different companies. It doesn't necessarily mean that it would be worth your while moving the mortgage. Um, wh when I come to remortgage someone, the first thing I ask them to do is see what their lender will offer them. Once, once we know what that is, I can make a comparison to the open market. If it's financially in your interest to move it, I can justify moving it. If it's not, then you take the deal they're offering and you stay where you are for another two, five years, however long. But if you need to speak to me, Denise, feel free. I don't charge fees. Are we entering the, the time where the 25-year mortgage is no longer standard and it will be extended further? I would say 30 years is probably standard now. Is it 30 years standard? I have to... I don't have to justify a 30-year mortgage, whereas on a 35, I might have to put a little note in saying that this is due to affordability. Um, mortgages, it, it, it's, this is where advice comes in. I could talk to a young couple. I may recommend a 35-year mortgage, um, and the reason I might do that is affordability, not from the lender's point of view, but from what we know it, it costs to live. And you've got to be very careful that you can put financial pressure on somebody if you overstretch their budget. And sometimes I'll get people say to me, we can afford 800. And I'm looking at their finances thinking, you'd be better off with 700 or 750. Um, I might then make a suggestion that we take a slightly longer term and if they want to overpay it they can most lenders will allow you to overpay but you're only committed to that if for example um, you've got a young professional that's going to um, you've got a young professional he's going through training there's he's in the junior partnership bit of a practice say a law practice or, or an accountancy practice and you know that his money's going to go up, then you can say, right, let's set this to a reasonable budget because you want to buy a home, not a sell, basically. You want to buy somewhere to live and somewhere where you can enjoy life, not somewhere where you're trapped. When you go to uh, full-fledged, you can then reduce the term of that mortgage by paying the extra 50 when you, re when you review your deal. Okay, yeah. 